I dive into a second conversation on the future of democracy in Europe. Uh, just quickly on schedule, our, our plan is to break at four o'clock. Uh, so we'll have a thick conversation between now and then with a brief coffee break there in there. Um, and we get to do this by the sea, where you get to think about big picture, long-term uh, questions, including questions that sometimes stir the, the pot of what's familiar. Uh, a little bit like Miroslav Volf in his wrestling um, from reading Shadi Hamid's new book, The Problem of Democracy, which is an Oxford Press book that was just published uh, last month, uh, encouraged. Um, Shadi describes being a college student during 9-11 and wrestling with the realities of what was in play. And he decided that this book, which I think is his fifth by my count, technically two, two were co-authored, okay? So two were co-authored. His third sole author book, but it's his, his fifth book, uh, to dive directly into the idea of democracy itself, to wrestle with it and question it. And having spent considerable time in Egypt uh, under an authoritarian regime uh, where uh, tensions and possibilities for democracy didn't always turn out so very well uh, to look candidly at, at democracy, uh, including at times when it produces bad outcomes. Um, uh, the book is all about the inherent value of democracy uh, and not necessarily just as a means to an end, but democracy itself. And Helene Landemore um, of France and now of Yale um, does the same. She asks uh, hard, fresh, outside the box questions about <laughs> new ways to think about the ways democracies actually function. What if we reimagine them substantially, uh, she asks, and applied new ways of doing democracy, even more open or random selection, both in developed countries, perhaps even in some of the world's most undemocratic regions. Um, this is meant to be sort of a big think conversation uh, this afternoon. Uh, we've talked sometimes about Faith Angle doing best by the sea. Uh, getting away. Um, and this conversation, I hope, will be just a little bit like that, uh, to, to, to ask some questions we don't often get to think in, in daily life. Uh, I think instead of telling you anything more about their arguments, uh, let them do it. Um, and we're going to start with Shadi uh, for the first 25 minutes, and then we're going to turn to Ellen for the next 20 minutes or so um, uh, to talk about uh, the thesis of their books and what it means for the future uh, of democracy in the West and in, in, in Europe in particular. Um, Eileen uh, Landemore, just to supplement what you have in your own bios in your program, uh, grew up here in France, took her master's degree in political science and philosophy from Sciences Po and the Sorbonne, respectively. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science from Harvard and has taught political science at Yale for 13 years. Democratic theory, political epistemology, uh, theories of justice, philosophy of the social sciences, workplace democracy, She's written on Hume. She won the Spitzer Prize for her book on democratic reason. And her latest two books, Open Democracy and Debating Democracy, have stirred the pot by arguing for non-electoral representation, uh, including by random selection and by making societies more rather than less democratic in the way they actually function. Um, she's also advised the Parliament of Finland to integrate crowdsourcing and has worked with the French Parliament uh, on its Economic, Social, and Environmental Council, uh, including its experimentation with randomly selected citizens, putting them their, rec their, practices, uh, their recommendations to practice for climate change and other uh, reforms. Um, for his part, Shadi is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He hosts the weekly podcast, uh, Wisdom of Crowds. He's the co-host of a new podcast called Zealots at the Gate with a Christian co-conspirator. He's a contributing writer at The Atlantic. Uh, he also is now the professor of Islamic studies at Fuller Seminary. I think the first at that school, and certainly um, maybe one of the first in any evangelical Christian uh, uh, seminary in the United States uh, to be teaching uh, uh, from a Muslim point of view. Uh, Prospect Magazine named Shadi one of the world's top 50 thinkers in 2019. And in his 20, 2017 book, uh, Islamic Exceptionalism, uh, how the struggle over Islam is reshaping the world was shortlisted for the, the Gelber Prize, the Lionel Gelber Prize. Um, his, um, Shadi holds a PhD in politics from Oxford. He was a Mar Marshall Scholar, earned a BS and a MA at Georgetown. Uh, his newest book, uh, which I think, again, hopefully will he'll tell us a little bit more about open con today's conversation. Uh, full title is The Problem of Democracy, America in the Middle East, and the Rise and Fall of an Idea. Uh, Shadi, welcome back to Faith Angle. And Take it away. Great. Uh, thanks, Josh. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, great to be here with all of you. So let's get right to it. I think this is the fundamental question of our time. 
what do we do when democracy produces bad outcomes? And I tend to put bad in scare quotes, and we'll get to why I do that in a moment. So this is the problem of democracy. And you know, I'll talk about some of the broader outlines of, of these dilemmas and then try to apply them more to the European context. So why are we talking about bad outcomes? In part, because there are more bad outcomes. Um, I think that's pretty noticeable if you look at elections across the globe. But despite that, I'm pretty bullish about democracy. So, um, and I'm, yeah, optimistic, I think is actually the right word. Now, you know, if you're, a, if you're a normal person, I think this might strike you as an odd time to sing the praises of democracy, but uh, luckily you're not normal people. So maybe you'll be um, receptive to my argument. Um, so the democratic idea finds itself, I think, in a kind of paradox. It manages to be two things at once. It's uncontested at the theoretical level. No one actually t tends to argue for autocracy with maybe one or two exceptions, but that's not necessarily a very effective call to arms. Um, so it's uncontested in theory, but it's unpopular in practice. So we have a bit of a tension here. And the Belgian historian uh, David Van Raybrook has a good quote to this effect. He says, there is something strange going on with democracy. Everyone seems to want it, but no one believes in it any longer. So we're a bit trapped. We all want it, but we don't believe in it. So what do we do about that? Now, um, before I dive into the meat of some of my arguments and, and perhaps provocations, I wanna try something out a little that's a little bit different with no advance warning. And I'm not sure this will work precisely as I wanted to, but let's let's give it a shot. Wait, um, wait, a metaphor. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so um, there's two questions I wanna pose and maybe we'll just take the first two people who respond. You shouldn't overthink it. It should just be your sort of instinctual answer. So the two questions are this, uh, why do you think democracy is good? What do you think democracy is for? Who wants to take a stab at answering those two just quickly? Just you're just, you know, it doesn't have to be like very well considered. Yeah, Mar. Best thing we've tried so far. That's why it's good or? That's why it's good. Okay, and then what, it, what do you think democracy is for? Uh, for human rights. Interesting. Okay, who, who else? Um, okay. It's the only form of government where the governed and the govern, governing are one and the same. And so it's the only form that secures the and that's why it's good. Yes. And what do you think democracy is for? Securing the interests. Okay, securing the interests. Okay, those are, um, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, well, I, I was hoping someone would sort of, uh, you know, uh, highlight a stronger tension, but there was a little, I think we'll get to some of the tensions, we're good, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> it's a bunch of elites in the south of France, Shadi. Exactly. Not the man yeah. on the street. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so I think what's interesting about these two questions in tandem is that they relate to each other, but I do think they're asking two different things. And just to focus on the first part of it, oh, why is democracy good? So um, one way of looking at it is that if democracy is good, it it's good because it enables other good things to happen. Or in other words, it leads to good outcomes. And it could include something like human rights or securing human freedom or liberalism specifically, uh, gender equality, minority rights. We might have a whole basket of things that we think democracy is better at, better at producing. The other approach is to say that democracy is good for some sort of spiritual reason, which, we, which your answer has also touched on irrespective of its outcome. So like, what's an example of a, a somewhat spiritual reason? You could say that democracy is good because it brings us closer to how uh, God meant us to be, um, that it aligns us better with our innate disposition as creatures of, of, of God. Um, and, you know, Muslims refer to this as the fitra, which is um, kind of human nature or the innate disposition so certainly in Islam and Christianity, you do have this idea of bringing man closer to what uh, he should be. So that could be a broader spiritual argument. And then similar to what Cyril said earlier, um, you can also look at it 
in another way that the alternative to democracy, despotism, is bad because it distorts the human spirit, it corrupts the soul, it corrupts society. There's inherently something about authoritarianism that makes us other than what we should be. Because you have a state that is dominating what you can think and feel and do, and that takes us away from our nature the way that God created us. Okay. Um, then, of course, uh, there's more pragmatic answers. Um, democracy is good because it allows us to choose our leaders. But then you get to a difficulty. Why do we think it's good to choose our leaders? So when you start asking these questions, you do it does really allow you to get to first principles. Because we, I think, especially as Americans, we take for granted that choosing our leaders is good. But why do we think choosing our leaders is good? That might take a little bit more reflection. Now, the second question, what is democracy for? That's a little, uh, that's a little bit more practical because it's meant to get people to think about specific, um, specific outcomes. So, but even here we have a problem because if you're thinking about more practical outcomes, you may say that, for example, democracy is supposed to give us competent leaders. But does, is that the point of democracy? Does democracy actually give us more competent leaders? And I think Britain would offer us a cautionary tale in this regard. But I think it's also, if you look at U.S. elections, it's obviously the case that voters often prioritize other things than competence. I don't think if you look at Trump voters, competence was necessarily the orienting um, incentive. They were voting for other reasons, irrespective of competence. And there's also, and Ellen and I were talking about this the other night over dinner, that if you think competence is the goal of democracy, then why would why would democracy be the best way to get to competence? Because if that is your end goal, that's what you value. There's other paths that can bring us to competent leadership. You might say that a technocracy, technocratic elites who are highly well educated in specific subject matter, they would be the ones who would be most competent to say handle the economy. And of course, that is the approach that Italy took with Mario Draghi. And then also the Fed is an example of this idea of technocratic expertise where leaders are unaccountable. And then the last two outcomes I want to mention, because you hear this a lot, is that democracy brings us closer to consensus or unity. That's what democracy should do. Joe Biden likes to talk about this quite a bit. And here's a quote that gives you a taste of this argument. This is from a press conference, so it wasn't prepared. Um, so he said this, think about it. You know, things are moving so damn rapidly. Things are changing so rapidly in the world of science and technology and a whole range of other issues that the question is, <laughs> in a democracy that's such a genius as ours, can you get consensus in the time frame that can compete with autocracy? It's a little bit of a jumble, but he's basically saying that if we want to be able to compete with China and other authoritarian regimes, we have to show that we can be effective and that we can deliver consensus. But is democracy supposed to produce consensus? I mean, there's another school of thought that would say that democracy requires the lack of consensus. If you had a consensus, then what would people really be voting about? And um, the Belgian uh, political theorist, who I like a lot, Chantal Mouffe, makes the argument that in a true democracy, um, a, a true democracy is about bringing out conflict. Democracy is supposed to be conflictual because when you have a consensus, it means that someone decides what the consensus is because you have to decide who is outside of the fold. That's how you define the consensus against the extremists and the radicals who are outside of the consensus. So that's the risk there. And then lastly, economics, a democracy produces better economic outcomes, but we know this is not always the case. And Tunisia is an example that looms large. The last uh, remaining uh, bright spot of the Arab Spring. But as some of you may know, just a year ago, there was a slow motion coup that was instituted. And now Tunisia is no longer a democracy which means there is, um, there's not a single democracy that resulted from the Arab Spring. Tunisia was our, yeah, quite literally the last positive example. Okay, so those are, those are practical outcomes. And then there's a, broader, there's a broader issue here about 
when we say democracy, and, and I've sort of been trying to uh, fight an uphill battle for a long time, that oftentimes people mean liberal democracy. So they're packing in other assumptions without telling you, the reader, that that's what they're talking about. So oftentimes people will use democracy as a shorthand for liberal democracy, and they'll sort of hide the liberal part um, or assume it, right? And I think this isn't so much an argument as an assumption that many simply assume that liberalism, small l liberalism and small d democracy go together. And I want to just take that on because I think that that's at the heart of some of these debates, especially now. And just to be clear on terms here, um, I'm talking here about the classical liberal tradition. So um, the emphasis on individual rights, personal autonomy, gender equality, minority rights, the primacy of reason over revelation, the primacy of the individual over the collective. It doesn't mean that there can't be religion, but it, it implies a restricted role for religion. So even if you look at um, the Rawlsian vision of political liberalism that has more room for religion, even he draws a clear line. He says that you can believe in your comprehensive doctrines as much as you want, but when you're in the public sphere, you should only make arguments that are intelligible to people who don't share your comprehensive doctrine. In other words, if, if you're an evangelical, and you're arguing on a TV show or writing a book or whatever it might be, or as a politician, you should not use Christianity to justify your policy arguments because non-Christians will not be able to get on board with your starting assumptions. So these are some of the classic aspects of the liberal tradition. And they're conflated because in the Western context, they did go together, or at least they went together for quite some time but it doesn't mean they always did or that they always will. And I think we can just go back to the founders to see how the founders were very, very conscious of liberalism and democracy diverging and being different things. So for example, and I'm always surprised by this. I mean, I've read this stuff before, but in rereading some of the, um, you know, some of the letters, speeches, and then and, and things like the Federalist Papers, uh, the founders, I don't want to say they were anti-democratic, but sometimes they were anti-democratic. So John Adams said, for example, there never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. That's intense, right? And then James Madison, the father of the Constitution, he says in the Federalist Papers, democracies are as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. So it's interesting that both Adams and Madison are using the imagery of death and dying to talk about democracy. I mean, I personally wouldn't describe democracy that way. So that tells you something that the founders were aware of a particular tension. And I think one of the reasons we as modern, like as late moderns post 1990s forgot about this is in part because of the end of history or the supposed end of history that um, in the 1990s, it seems that there is a definitive endpoint. Liberalism and democracy go hand in hand. There aren't real challengers to liberalism. And so there's a sense of um, tr uh, tr a triumph, uh, of being triumphant, really, that you didn't really, you didn't have to resolve the tension between liberalism and democracy because they went together. But then over time, we start to realize that we were maybe a little bit too triumphant and too soon. And, you know, as someone who spent time in the Middle East during some of these key moments, I think it was actually the Middle East that showed us how liberalism and democracy diverge when no one was really paying attention to the Middle East. So, for example, the 89 elections in Jordan, where the Muslim Brotherhood did incredibly well, 1991 Algeria, where an Islamist party was about to come to power, the secular military stepped in and staged a coup to cancel elections. 1995 in Turkey, the first time an Islamist party came to power through free elections, so on and so forth, right? So in the 90s, when everyone else was triumphant, the Middle East, when they were holding free elections or trying to hold free elections, it was illiberal, religiously oriented parties, Islamist parties in other words, that were performing very well or winning outright. But of course, we tended to see the Middle East as somewhat exceptional, that you know these were Arabs and Muslims who can't really get their act together. Uh, people in other democracies won't necessarily have to face these tensions. Um, and I even remember during the Arab Spring, I even thought 
that the Arab world was distinctive. And I used to contrast it very directly with the U.S. Because I remember under Obama, um, our big debates, at least some of them were universal health care, um, tax rates, deficit spending. There was even a time, some of you might recall the whole controversy over Obama's tan suit, right? Like Because people were so bored, they didn't have big questions to debate that Obama wearing a tan suit was seen as an outrage. And, you know, in some ways it was, but, you know, that's a different issue. Um, so, <laughs> so, and then during the Arab Spring, in these countries that were holding their first free democratic elections, I noticed that no one was talking about economics. In the several years that I was in the Middle East during this period, I don't think I got into one economics policy debate. It was completely erased from the public consciousness. What were people debating? Existential questions, the so-called who we are questions about the meaning of the state, um, what it means to be an Egyptian, um, the relationship between Islam and the state, the role of religion in public life, so on and so forth. And then what was interesting, I come back to the US in 2014 and then I start to see the American political debate changing and shifting away from policy towards existential questions, the future of the republic. Will democracy die? What does it mean to be an American? What is the nature of the American idea? What is the nature of the American founding? So in some ways, you know, we see a shift and we will talk about, you know, Europe a little bit more. And I'll mention a couple examples there. Um, But a big part of this is economic divides have dissipated in Western democracies. So you have um, economic populism becoming more popular on both the left and the right. So in the U.S., for example, there's been a convergence on economic issues. And Matt Iglesias um, had a very interesting phrase for this. He called, he described the Republican Party as being in the throes of unhinged moderation. They're moderating on economics, but crazy on non-economic issues. And it's true that if you look at congressional legislation in the Biden era, the last two years, Congress has actually been surprisingly effective and has passed a lot of bipartisan legislation. But no one cares and no one pays attention because they aren't cultural issues. They're either about economics or, or combating China's influence. So, um, but, so it's an interesting thing that be careful what you wish for. It might seem good that there's an economic convergence, but what that means in practice is that people have to find other ways to accentuate their differences. And if you don't have economic divides to orient your politics, what is there left? Culture, identity, and religion. And we do see something similar in Europe where, again, if you look at far-right parties, they are defenders of the welfare state in most of these countries. They're sometimes outflanking socialist parties on the left, on economic issues. And they're saying, we are the true defenders of the welfare state. So then there isn't a clear left-right economic difference. But what is the far-right offering that is distinctive? They're talking about these existential foundational questions about what makes a nation? What does it mean to be French? What does it mean to be Swedish? That is a thing, apparently. So, I mean... um, so, but that is, and then we'll, we'll talk about the Swedish elections uh, that should come up, and I'll, I'll mention it briefly. Um, so, just, uh, so the problem when you're debating these existential issues is that, first of all, obviously, it raises stakes of politics considerably. So much is at stake with every election. That's why people say this is the most important election of your lifetime. I heard that a lot in the lead up to the midterms, but... No single election should ever be the most important election of your lifetime. That phrase itself captures how something has gone wrong. We're projecting something on the democratic idea that it probably can't carry. Um, You know, it's a big weight to carry that every election, everything is at stake. And the danger, too, is that when you have exceptional times because so much is at stake, this gets back to our morning conversation you can promote exceptional measures. This is the argument, basically, that a lot of evangelicals make, that we are no longer in the age of normal politics. We are in the era of 
of um, existential politics. Our survival is at stake. So all the normal considerations about, you know, whether Trump is a terrible person or whatever else it might be, you suspend that because you're in the state of exception. That is, in effect, the argument. They don't always use that particular language because that draws from, you know, Carl Schmitt and other, other, you know, problematic philosophers and intellectuals. But this, this idea of suspending the rules is one that you hear on a regular basis. Um, and then, you know, Europe is a little bit different in the sense that um, the major issue is, has to do with existential issues around religion, but also the absence of religion. So that's very interesting, too. Obviously, most, uh, at least Western Europeans, are no longer church going, and the numbers are 10% or lower in most of these countries. But what's interesting is that the decline of Christianity hasn't taken religion out of the public conversation. If anything, it's accentuated the difference between nominal Christians and recent Muslim arrivals. So this is why in countries like France, Austria, Germany, and Sweden, the question of Islam is paramount. And for some parties, it is their number one issue. It is their defining uh, raison d'etre. And that's very interesting because even in a secularizing context, you can see how religion, at least in one way or another, is brought back as a primary cleavage. And this is where I get to what happened in Sweden recently in the September elections. Um, I'm sure all, you know, most of you will have heard the broad outlines of what happened. It's quite fascinating, but um, the, far, uh, the far right party, the Swedish Democrats, is now the largest party in the governing coalition. First time it's ever happened. Um, and this is not just your kind of standard run-of-the-mill right-wing populist party. Um, they're pretty far right. Um, we can debate about their neo-Nazi origins. You know, there is a kind of history there. Um, and one of their main issues that they were camp campaigning on is Muslims. That is, sometimes they'll couch it as anti-immigrant sentiment. But the immigrants they're concerned about are primarily Muslims who don't integrate, assimilate, and so forth. And they also use the threat of Muslims demographically to, as, a proxy, as a kind of proxy for crime, disorder, and that sort of thing. So they're able to take Islam and Muslims and create a kind of package of issues that do apparently resonate with a growing number of Swedes. And Sweden does have one of the highest uh, Muslim populations in, in Europe. So Pew had a demographic um, projection. And if, if there's medium migration, I um, mean, they measured that in, 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 in certain ways, that Sweden, by 2050, 20% of its population will be Muslim. If a, in a high migration scenario, which I don't think is going to happen because they're already uh, clamping down considerably and, and this, the effects of civil wars such as in Syria are no longer as present, but Pew released this in 2018, and the high migration projection was 30% of Sweden would be Muslim by 2050. But people use these demographic projections to warn about a fear and to say that action has to be taken now to prevent these potential outcomes where Muslims basically will change the, the character of Sweden as we know it. And that what could be more existential than that? That is a who we are question, not a what works in policy question. And then you have someone like um, Wilders and the PVV um, in, in the Netherlands. And that's interesting because the couple parties I mentioned, so in Sweden, but also the Brothers of Italy, um, in Italy, which is also a far-right party, these are generally seen as illiberal parties, and they're illiberal parties that are coming to power through free elections. So Italy might have its first uh, far-right prime minister um, in the post-war period, and she will have been democratically elected. That'll be interesting to see. But we also, as in the Netherlands, have parties that say that they are defenders of the liberal tradition, defenders of enlightenment values, and they use that to justify illiberal policies against Muslims. So basically they say that Muslims don't respect the liberal tradition 
They don't respect enlightenment values, so we have to restrict their freedom. So I've called this before, um, uh, you know, illib basically illiberal liberalism or liberal illiberalism, depending on how you see it. But you basically restrict freedoms in the name of protecting freedoms. Okay, I'll close up. Yeah. Great. So uh, and then France obviously has its examples of this of this too. The 2004 law on conspicuous religious symbols, which restricts the ability of Muslim women, also technically um, Christians wearing crosses, uh, but the main purpose of that legislation was hijab. Um, I don't think people really question that. Um, and then so you're restricting the right of women to you know, choose their dress because their religious expression is seen as a threat to a kind of liberal, secular, enlightenment consensus. And I, so, so as I just close up, I, want, I, I do want to highlight, I just want to dwell on France for a moment because I see France as a test for me because I think the policies towards the Muslims in France are kind of outrageous. Um, the anti-separatism bill, I think, is a travesty. But it is a reflection of the democratic will. This is what the majority of French citizens want and vote for, you know, through their representatives. And if you look at all the polling, there is strong support for restricting the hijab in state institutions and institutions of public education. Um, so I might not like this, you know, as a Muslim myself, but I think the test of democracy is to say, even if it produces an outcome that I consider to be personally threatening, I have to respect that. And that is also what I would counsel um, you know, French Muslim citizens, they should oppose it and they should speak out and try their best to persuade their fellow, their fellow French men and women. But at the end of the day, they might not be able to convince a majority. Um, and we also see similar, similar sorts of bills in Switzerland with the minaret ban, for example. Another, example, another instance of restricting a certain kind of religious expression. So I'll just close up with some general conclusions here is that it's very hard to decide or to agree on what a good outcome is because we no longer have a shared sense of reality. We no longer have the same ontological premises. And if you don't have the same first premises, it becomes very hard to adjudicate what is of merit, what is worthy, what has value. So these are ultimately normative questions that we can no longer ascertain because we live in divided societies. So we no longer agree on the foundational questions. So then we have no way of rendering definitive judgment on um, good or bad outcomes. We're never going to get consensus on that. We're never going to be able to return to a time when consensus was possible. So with that in mind, my, my approach is more minimalistic. And what I propose um, in the book and in a lot of my work is, is what I call democratic minimalism, which is falling back on democracy as a system of conflict management, as a way to manage discontent and a way to resign ourselves to uncertainty. It's not about these broader, more ambitious goals because democracy, if it ever could, can no longer produce these other good things that we want from it. And we can still believe in the resilience of democracy without good outcomes. And I think the UK and Italy and Sweden, three recent um, transfers of power, people saw that and they said, this shows that democracy is, isn't bad. It's not working. Italy voted for uh, a far right party. Sweden did in the UK. Is it, you know, let's not, uh, however you want to describe what happened in the UK. But there's another way to say that we, the, these three cases were examples of democracy doing what it was supposed to do in the sense of rotation of power, alternating leaders, and allowing citizens to exp express their discontent with the ruling elite. So in Italy, why did 20 26% of Italians vote for a far right party? They were using their vote as a way to signal discontent. Some of them were doing it out of a protest vote. They were saying, we don't like what the establishment parties have doing have been doing, so we're gonna vote in a particular way. So in this sense, voting is a way of sending information, and it's a way for us as observers to perceive new information. We see how people vote, we don't have to like it, but it tells us something important about how democracy is operating. 
so in this sense, um, I guess I'm, I'm kind of calling for uh, the idea of democracy as the right to make the wrong choice. That to me is the essence of the democratic idea. So that in a sense lowers, it, it, um, it lowers our expectations, it readjusts our expectations, and therefore we get away from a situation where we project too much of a burden on the democratic idea and end up being disillusioned and disappointed. So it may be time to be minimalist. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. More open. Helen. It's 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 on. Just you maybe it takes a little bit of time. The thing. Ah, yes, yes, yes. No worries. <clears throat> You hear me now? Yes, yeah. perfect. Great. Thank you. So, uh, mm, I'm in the process of writing a new book called uh, Politics Without Politicians. I think the title, Sounds you know, great. says it all. <laughs> but I can also try to summarize my views through, through two quotes and a few statistics. So there's a quote that is often cited back to me, actually, when I present uh, by uh, American conservative William F. Buckley, who famously said, I'd rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston telephone book than by the Harvard faculty. And many people take this quote in a benign way as meaning that, well, academics don't necessarily make great legislators, right? They, they're eccentric, they're, they're out of touch, etc. But I take it in a more radical way, which I think is compatible with both a progressive and a, and a conservative outlook. I take it as meaning that our social and economic elites whom most of our elected politicians come from, do not, do not necessarily make for great legislators. And um, that if the goal <clears throat> is to track the common good, a random row of the population, such as that provided by the first 200,000, um, the f f first 2,000 names in a phone booth, um, in the phone book, would actually be better, and at the very least could not do worse. And in fact, my first book, Democratic Reason, was a compendium of the social scientific reasons um, as to why that insight is actually right. So um, there are intuitions dating back to the sophists, but that are, that are now sort of supported by social scientific evidence that collective intelligence is more a function of group properties than individual's competence. And so as long as we think, oh, in order to get great legislators, we need to identify individually smart people, we're actually, we're actually making a really dramatic um, mistake because we should focus on the composition of our group of legislators. And it may matter more that they are diverse and you know, um, come from a different sort of uh, um, places in the world, both symbolically and, and, uh, and, and, and really, than they're very smart or very educated or, or come from a particularly elite school, like it's the case in, in, uh, in um, in England or, or France particularly. I'm very sorry that Simon Cooper couldn't be here because I actually think his book Chumps really, uh, you know, sort of is an a excellent example of what's wrong with this kind of system that bet everything on the supposed individual uh, quality of, of, um, of, our, of our rulers. So the other quote that I um, think is, uh, you know, a good illustration of what I think um, I found in a book by the late Maurice Pope, who has a forthcoming uh, Albert Posthumous book, coming out in, in the spring called The Keys to Democracy. And it's a quote by a, a British uh, essayist called J.K. Chesterton. It reads like this. All real democracy is an attempt like that of a jolly hostess to bring the shy people out. And this quote describes exactly what I've seen firsthand uh, in the context of the, the 2019 uh, French Citizens Convention for Climate, which was an assembly of 150 randomly selected citizens, as well as, a, as well as an attempt by President Macron to bring about a new mode of democratic governance based on lot and deliberation. And in that group, you had former stutters, timid youngsters, women, older folks, other minorities who are used to taking the backstage in our current politics, who came out of their shell and developed uh, you know, the courage to speak up and, and use their voice and, and bring perspectives that are usually not taken into account. I also like that this quote captures um, 
the reason why, to me, electoral democracy will never be real democracy. No matter where, whether we take money out of politics with all these things, I don't think it can succeed. Elections thrive on the ability of individuals to stand out and compete for votes. And as such, they are bound to exclude the shy, this category that I think we, we should pay attention to. Uh, parties and politics is about scoring points against perceived opponents in a fight to win or retain power. And it turns off by construct, by design, self-effacing and easily intimidated people, as well as those who despise, who despise self-promotion and aggressive tactics. So the reference to um, a jolly hostess also appeals to me because at its best, democracy should be inviting. It should encourage people uh, who at least want power and lack, lack the self-confidence to speak up, to find their inner voice and make it hard. So I think if, you know, if we take this quote seriously, then it, it gives us a, uh, an idea of what a real democracy looks like. It should be welcoming, inviting, nurturing. Now you might say, well, why do we care about the shy people, right? Um, well, for the same reason that you know, um, I think we, we should care about uh, the competence of the group and, and the, the outcomes that a, a democracy produce, produce, produces. Because they know stuff the arrogant do not, or at least they know that they don't know, uh, unlike um, the arrogant who are uh, drawn to powers. So I, as, as an example of the shy, I, I often think of uh, the, the yellow vests, for example, who are typically absent from um, you know, uh, the, the world of politics. They, they don't think, they speak well enough to be um, running a campaign, to be elected, to be um, present and to influence uh, um, policies. So now on to statistics. So uh, I just wanted to mention this uh, Pew Research Center survey, which was conducted in four countries in November and December of 2020. It found that two thirds of adults in France and the US and 50% of people in the UK believe their political system needs major changes. Uh, in, in the US, it's really striking that two in three Americans agree that the phrase most politicians are corrupt describe their countries well. But meanwhile, the same people uh, in, in France, the US, the UK, and Germany, which has less distrust in its politicians, in all these countries, there is considerable interest in political, poli uh, in political reforms that would potentially allow ordinary citizens to have more power over policymaking, so the shy people. And in particular, um, people in these countries are aware of and in favor of so-called citizens' assemblies, which are these forums where citizens are chosen at random to debate issues of national importance and make recommendations about what should be done. They're incredibly popular in a way that I, I myself didn't expect to, to find out. So in around three quarters, uh, in, in each of these countries, around three quarters or more say it is very or somewhat important for the national government to create citizens' assemblies. And about four in 10 say it's very important. Um, so I, in a minute, I'll, I'll talk about the examples I know best, which are um, the French Convention on, uh, for Climate, which took place in 2019. And now, uh, it's, it's a very recent process, the, the Convention on Assisted Dying, that's also going to take place in France starting in December, and I was an observer of the French Convention for Climate, and I'm now on the governance committee of this new um, Convention on Assisted Dying. So it's very exciting because I saw it from the outside first uh, for eight months in the case of the French Convention for Climate, and now I'm like seeing it from the inside. I see all the politics. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I am aware of the contradiction that there is between advocating for you know, um, citizen autonomy and then being myself an expert on the governance committee of that assembly. And so I'll get to, to that point as well. But Because um, there are a lot of steps because we can get to my ideal vision, obviously. So I just want to spend just a few minutes explaining what I think is wrong with elections and electoral democracies, because I think it's not intuitive for, for most people. For most people, when we think of democracy, we think of elections. And in fact, I was again struck by this um, at, at lunch today. Like we spend the entire lunch talking about politics, but what was it about? Elected officials, their personalities, their quirks, 
there are, you know, there are problems and we never get to talk about the issues. And, and for me, that's another indictment of electoral politics. Uh, so what's wrong with electoral democracy? It's that it's not that democratic to begin with, historically, if you look back at the origin in the 18th century and slightly before. It's basically a liberal and republican construct, but it's, it, it's not a democratic construct. It was not meant as one. In fact, it was meant as, a, as, a, as both, a, it was built in opposition to both monarchies and democracies because they were associated with mob rule. Why do we call them these this representative governments as they were called in the 18th century? Why do we call them democracies? Well, um, we started to call them democracies quite late actually, circa 1830 in the US and France and 1870 in Great Britain. Uh, and we call them that because we've indeed democratized the franchise. But that doesn't mean we've democratized that much the actual ruling part, who's, who's in charge. So when I, 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 I heard this, um, uh, Gadi, you said, well, democracy is the only regime where the rulers and the rules are the same. Well, that's not true. It's just not true. The, the rulers in a democracy, in an electoral democracy, are not the same as the rule. They are usually taken from the very narrow sample of the population and they don't look anything like the people. So it's a fiction. It's, of course, a nice fiction. It's an ideal. And we, we're aspiring to it, but in ways that I fall short of the ideal because we're not using the right methods, including the, 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 the use of elections. So I think that that also solves a little bit the, the, the sort of paradox that Shadi was mentioning earlier, like how come democracy is still so popular and yet people are, it's still the ideal and yet it's so unpopular, right? Well, I think it's because, yes, the, the, the goal and the vision of self-rule and people's power is still attractive. It's just that we've yet to actually realize it. And I think the current model is very defective. By and the way, house rules, if you, get a, if you get a shout out from a Harvard PhD speaker, you get the first question. So just get uh, it ready. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just want to say that, um, so, so I, I didn't used to be so skeptical. I used to think, well, it's just a matter of time. We're going to get there. We're just going to you know, um, get money out of politics, educate people, encourage working class uh, you know, candidates. I no longer think that's possible. I no longer think that's true. Um, and I think the, the, the real problem is really fundamentally with the electoral selection mechanism, which if, you li if we had listened to Aristotle and Rousseau and more recently Bernard Menin and now also Van Rebroek, we would have you know, faced up to the fact that elections are an oligarchic selection mechanism, which is by, contracts, by construct uh, meant to select from uh, the social and economic strata. Uh, and why is that? It's because elections rely on human choice, which is inherently discriminatory and biased towards certain traits, and it's typically going to be things like charisma, eloquence, height, um, which are often correlated with things like wealth and, and other things. So anyway, so I, I think that once we face up to that, um, we can start um, looking at solutions. And one of the solutions is to say, uh, well, how about we return to the ancient ideal of selecting our representatives by lot, right? Which is an um, equalizing um, selection mechanism that ensures that everyone has access to power, that, that ensures that you get a, a statistically uh, representative sample or as close to a representative sample of the larger population, and which therefore ensure that the shy get a seat at the table and that their views are integrated and including at the very uh, in, you know, beginning of the process and hopefully throughout. Um, so why is it that we're stuck in this 18th century model of democracy, so a liberal Republican version of a, 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 a liberal Republican regime? I think because um, when we reinvented democracy in the 18th century, we endorsed these um, notions of individual rights and popular consent, which are very valuable, but they're not necessarily, they're not entirely neatly aligned with democratic values like, say, um, equal access to power. Um, so so what, what do I propose instead? Again, um, this idea of open democracy, and a democracy that is open to all on equal grounds, and the heart of, of it um, is a citizen legislature 
um, you know, um, staffed by uh, civic lotteries. Uh, and again, we can look back at the one example, the one functional example of something like that that we have, which is uh, classical FN. So of course, classical FN, classical FN was very small. It was around 80,000 80, citizens. It was also based on slavery and very exclusionary in some ways. But I think they really did get one thing right, uh, which is that they chose their representatives and magistrates by lot rather than through elections. They did see election as a tool of the oligarchy. Uh, and they only used the elections, in fact, to uh, choose generals like Pericles. What's also interesting, because I was thinking about the connection to religion, and I didn't see one initially, but actually in ancient Greece, um, why did they believe in lot? They, they didn't have statistics. This is a science that you, know, you have to wait the 19th century for, for the law of large numbers to be fully understood, for the, the benefits of um, aggregation you know, of, of large quantities of judgment to be understood. So their reason, I think it was an intuitive, proto-probabilistic understanding, probably. But it also had a religious dimension, actually. In a way, they trusted the gods to identify the right people for them, rather than um, having the hubris to think that their individual flawed human choice would be able to do that, to, would be able to identify the right, um, the right rulers. But at any rate, um, let us remember that the fundamental institutions of ancient Athens were the Council of 500, which was an agenda setting body uh, for the whole polity of, of uh, randomly selected citizens. And the other one was the Ecclesia, which was the assembly of the people, numbering around 8,000 people, who voted up or down the laws put forward by the council. And meanwhile, you had these large randomly selected juries, uh, uh, popular juries, that judged um, in po political trials, including, for example, the one that um, ended with Socrates' uh, government mandated suicide. So it was a combination of large citizen juries and open assemblies that made the law in classical Athens. And they were all served by an army of very competent administrators, mostly slaves. So in my open democracy model, I envision basically a third model that borrows from the Greek model, but also, of course, from modern representative democracies, including um, things like referenda and, and of course liberal rights because I think we, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater and there are of course certain things that are very valuable about this legacy of um, social contract theory and, and liberalism. But um, the main characteristic is that instead of having a, a, a parliament that is um, you know uh, the upper crust of society more or less um, you've got the whole variety of backgrounds, gender, um, minorities, etc., And it also gives everyone the, the hope and the chance to represent and being represented in turn. If you do that at all levels of the polity, uh, it becomes statistically quite probable that you would get a chance to exercise power, not just be the subject of rule by others. So, in this vision, it's a lot more about equal distribution of power than consent to uh, the rulers. Um, so there are many benefits to that system, uh, anti-corruption benefits, epistemic benefits that I'm not going to go into. Um, I just want to now focus on the examples because of course this sounds like a very far-fetched idea and it is and it's a provocation in some respects and uh, what we're going to go toward most likely at least in advanced Western democracies is a hybrid model because I don't think anybody's close to, you know, uh, willing to replace elected uh, chambers. Um, so what examples do we have that, gives us a, that give us a sense of what that could look like, this hybrid model, or, or, or if some country or some institution were willing to really go all the way autocratic, what could it look like? So we have evidence. Um, in fact, a recent report by the OECD, subtitled Catching the Deliberative Wave, documents close to 600 cases of government-sponsored um, mini publics, so these uh, samples of the population, usually used for policy recommendations. But some of them, very few, have even been given some sort of pre legislative role. So they are getting closer to that uh, citizen legislature uh, vision that I was mentioning. And most of these examples are in Europe, actually, um, specifically Ireland, Iceland, Belgium, and France. So uh, I'll 
I'll just briefly mention the, the Irish ones. You may have heard of, of those uh, citizens' assemblies. There was one in, in 2012 around marriage equality. There was one in 2016 on abortion. Both led to referendum that um, endorsed an extension of rights to, to people and, and the decriminalization of abortion in particular. And I just want to focus now on the fourth example, which is um, uh, of all those I could cite that I had pre-legislative pre power. It's the 2019-2021 French Citizen Convention for Climate. So that was basically the answer of Macron to the yellow vest. The yellow vest you know, erupted because of the carbon tax. So after two months of great national debate, Macron said, OK, fine, I heard you. You're not happy with my carbon tax. I'm going to take a sample of 150 of you. Just do better. How are you going to solve climate change if you don't want a carbon tax? And the citizens took this very seriously. They worked hard over nine months with the help of experts. And they came up with something that didn't include a carbon tax, but 149 proposals uh, ranging from making uh, housing renovation mandatory by a certain date to banning certain commercial flights to, you know, that were too short or, you know, things like that. And a lot of, I mean, a number of those proposals were implemented in our um, climate and resilience law of 2021. It wasn't as ambitious as the convention had hoped for, so there was a bit of disappointment there. But um, it was still the most ambitious climate bill that we've ever had to, to date. And um, the question now is, can these be institutionalized or are they just you know, ad hoc products of the will of the prince? Like Macron convened this convention, can this become a regular part of the, of, of the functioning of the Fifth Republic, right? Um, that's gonna be the challenge for the second convention that, I, that I'm gonna be a part of because we, we, we don't know. The, the, the question is, can this become a political actor that has uh, actual, an actual impact on policy debates and, and legislative um, um, you know, activities. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So I just, um, yeah, I just want to say that this vision of open democracy is probably uh, very much an ideal, and but I think it's the, the mini publics themselves are very much um, uh, there and, and here to stay. I think because they have found support in the in the populations of many countries, because Meta is already experimenting with them online. Actually, as we speak, they've done. Um, couple of them on uh, issues of free speech and content regulation. They're going to do more. So if corporations like that, like this kind of like global corporations, find, find those things interesting to help them rule their community, I think they put it in an op-ed under that, that sort of a description, then I think states too should pay attention. And, and not just states, like any form of political organization should look into it to, to bring the shy people out and bring them to the table. Thank you very much. Great. So, all right, so bring the shy people out and bring out a little conflict. Uh, as, as Shadi says, so we got a little bit of that maybe going on. Um, let's play, plan on a three o'clock break. So we'll do it for 20 minutes now, take, take a short coffee break, and then we'll come back at, at, and, and wrap fully at four o'clock for, uh, for a proper break. First out of the gate is Thomas Chatterton Williams. Unless you've got, yeah, you don't have, yeah, if, if that, if you've got your, uh, if you've got your, your, your Table, table card up, you're on. Do you want you please? Uh, you got called out. <laughs> Come on. Uh, defend the ruled and the ruler. Okay, so um, uh, first uh, taxonomic uh, remark. Uh, oh, hit that button though, if you would, please. Which one is it? Uh, yes. This one? Yes. Um, both Madison and Adams re referred to the democracy. When they said democracy, they meant direct democracy, which was not the form of government that they were trying to create, which they called republicanism. These are both authors of constitutions, um, Massachusetts and the federal constitution. And, and, and Adams is an interesting case for this forum, I guess, because for him, uh, rights were rooted in Christianity, m while Madison attempted to separate church and state on different grounds. Uh, but that's a, that's a side remark. Um, I, I want to say to Shadi first that this is a Deweyan, as in John Dewey conception of democracy as, a, as experimentation. But now my, my, my main remark, <clears throat> I guess, is that I think we are employing a misleading map of rights, democracy, and nationalism in our elites uh, debate. And, and the map says that there, is, there are human rights on one end, and there is nationalism, which is 
which is fascism in the making, on the other hand, and these are the two poles, and this creates the illusion that democracy is on this side, on the side of human rights uh, or liberalism. But what is most interesting, I think, about the contemporary uh, map is that liberalism has turned against democracy. And that we see this because, because the attacks on nationalism are almost always an attack on the popular will. And so of necessity, while you reject nationalism, you also have to undermine the democratic mechanisms by which it expresses itself. And in the case of Israel, it's, it's very clear because we have the most activist court, uh, Supreme Court, in, except India, uh, in, the, in the democratic world. And, and that court is explicitly anti-democratic. And the only and, and, it, and what the, this elite that it represents strives to do is to denationalize Israel by way of bypassing all the mechanisms by which the populace expresses its will. So I always suspect that the allergy to populism among globalist elites is actually the allergy towards the populace. Um, and, and, and it hides behind an idea of human rights and projects a vision in which, and I'm, I'm not sure I got all the mechanism Helena was referring to, but it attacks the nation state by which uh, uh, the citizens express their wills in the name of a vision that has no account of citizenship. You read this, uh, I don't know, Yuval Noah Harari kind of vision of a technocratic globalist future, and there is no politics. There's only administration. So this goes back to the original progressivisms of the United progressives of the United States in the in the twenties, um, and I think back to even Woodrow Wilson, with a technocratic idea that we, the elite, the rational elite, the enlightened elite, we will teach the the, the people, we will show the people the right way, and we don't need to to ask them. In the same sense that you don't ask a patient right. how to operate on their heart. Right. Right. That's good. That's good. Shadi, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, so, you know, I'm sympathetic uh, to Getty to what you say in the sense that um, it is true that a growing number of liberal elites are disdainful of the popular will, however we want to define that. I think there was some evidence of that in the lead up to the midterms. I mean, I was very critical of Biden's speech just a few days before the midterms where he basically said um, there's only one party on the ballot, otherwise democracy, you'll help kill democracy. So, I mean, that is to me, like evidently anti-democratic in spirit. You know, when if there's only two parties in a democratic contest and you're basically saying that you only have one choice, no matter how bad we are, no matter how bad we govern, you still have to vote for us, otherwise everything will end. So, um, and then, of course, um, the, the rhetoric around misinformation, I feel, is, is another example of this. What is misinformation about? It's about delegitimizing bad ideas according to pre predominantly liberal experts. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes they are factually incorrect, the things that they're calling out. But other times they're calling out differences of opinion. And this is where the fact opinion distinction becomes a little bit blurry because facts are always embedded in worldviews. So who decides what worldview a fact should be embedded in? So I think that, um, and of course deplorables, all of this is a way to say that if people vote for right-wing parties, they're suffering under false consciousness. They don't know what's right for them. They don't know what their own interests are. And it's our job as elites, the educated, to inform them so once they have education, once they have information, then they'll vote the right way. I mean, this is really at the heart of, and I think it's worth being critical about that, even though I think um, right-wing populists are pretty scary um, in certain ways. I still have to acknowledge that they have to have representation because they represent something very real and deeply felt in their respective countries. All right, we've got uh, Emma Tucker, Thomas Chatterton Williams, Katrin Benhold, um, Rim Sarah, Marion Khan, and Matia Ferrezi. So let's just see how this plays in Carl Cannon. All right, uh, Emma Tucker, you're up next. Oh, no, I said Thomas. Sorry. Thomas Chatterton Williams, you're up next. Cool. Um, my name is Emma, and, uh, if, I, if I followed you correctly, I'm just, I'm really unclear why it was, I can't get to the first premise of why it would be desirable to have allegorical and why, like, in the society, as, as extremely ignorant 
Oh, yeah. Hit that mic, if you would, Thomas. Our friends are in, in a society as ignorant as America's, I just can't see how even the type of tentative steps towards having a citizen's council like mm -hmm. Macron did, I, cannot, I can't see how that would be um, in any way um, something that we would want to even pretend could be better than even, like, even aristocracy seems better to me than that. Why is it desirable? Yes, well, I mean, literally, like, it, it could be, I mean, it's, America's just such an extraordinary, irresponsible, ignorant society. Well, well let's, let's not put that, like, put, take your microphone off for that part. <laughs> no, just, just kidding, just so kidding. I, so I think, like, you're asking about why do we care about political <clears throat> equality, but that's basically questioning the, the whole premise of the American ideal. I mean, like, we're suppo supposed to be a democratic society where, where its citizens are equals and should have an, uh, an equal say. So th that say is restricted to voting in elections right now. All I'm saying is that if you're truly sincere about these beliefs that we're all equals, and we should extend that way beyond the choice of you know, elites to represent us and act on our behalf. And I think this re reluctance to expand reflects a very, very undemocratic and in fact elitist bias and prejudice against the ignorant and unwashed masses that I, I think your question reflects in some ways. And I, and I also think that the lack of education that you deplore, which is it's not completely you know, uh, untrue, unfortunately, is a, a product of that system which thrives on the apathy of the electorate, you know, doesn't pay for decent public education, um, burdens people with three jobs where leaving very, very little time to like read the news and educate yourself. I wouldn't blame the victims here. I would just really ask tough questions about the, the, the system itself and the elites who are busy cutting taxes and doing all kinds of things that are not really helping the ignorant masses to educate themselves. So I think it's a chicken and egg regress here. But my point is that if, if as we all pretend to, to be, we, we are Democrats, then the implications are a lot more radical than, than, than we're actually ready to, to admit. That, that makes sense to me. But well, you're, you, Americans aren't ready for the type of democracy that you're advocating no. uh, at all. But, no, but I, no, it, no, it no, would no, require a fundamental remaking of society to prepare Americans for actual democracy. Uh, yes, should have never left. but I, I'm fine with that. I'm a political theorist. I'm just offering a vision and then whether the, the U.S. in particular follows or not, that's not my problem, uh, I might say. I think Europe right now is a, a much more fertile ground for that kind of thinking because Belgium has already given, I mean, us Belgium, a very tiny sub part of Belgium, has already given agenda setting power to a council of uh, 27 randomly selected citizens. So they trust their people, at least in a sort of agenda setting function. France just gave quasi-legislative, pre-legislative power to a, a, a you know, a group of 150 randomly selected citizens. So I think there are countries who are already almost there. The US at the, at the federal level, I agree with you, it sounds highly improbable. Uh, at the state level, I think there's, there's more hope. And, but I don't see what's the alternative, because what you're saying is that like, there are only two alternatives. Either you turn on the, the liberal anti-majoritarian court base crews further, and you infuriate the populist basis, or you, you, you give way and you, and you open up the system and you listen. Because I think it's very different when we think of mobs, when we think of the unwashed masses, it's protest votes in you know, Brexit or the Trump vote. But if you bring a sample of the population and you have them talk to each other, it's not the same. Like the, the, the sort of um, incentives are different. They don't come as partisans, they come as uh, individuals. They listen, they learn, they change their minds occasionally, and they, they respectfully disagree, and they learn to you know, live with differences, and it's, it's a different thing. I think, I don't think I'll change your mind right here, right then. I invite you to come and, and witness the Convention on Assisted Dying. It's all in French, unfortunately, but uh, I think it will, I think it's the only way to change people's mind, because that, that's the only, that even I was sort of predisposed to believe in the, in the merits of those things. When I sat on, on, on the Convention for Climate, it, was, it had a very transformative effect. So I think you need to see it to believe it probably. Yeah, so just a quick note, because I, I feel like um, on, okay, so I guess I would start from a b very basic question. What is wrong with being ignorant? Why is that inherently disqualifying? 
but also who decides what constitutes ignorance. It is actually the case that the U.S. is, is significantly better educated today than it was at any, almost by definition, at any previous point in history. The degree of the, the percentage of the population that has college degrees, PhDs, you name it, this is the most well-educated the U.S. has ever been in its history, is right now at this very moment. Um, and I think also, um, instead of saying that people like, are ignorant in some way, I think we should ask ourselves, you know, are there legitimate reasons for someone to vote for Herschel Walker? My predilection is to say, instead of condemning or looking down on a, on a particular choice, Let's understand what moves someone to vote for someone who's relatively crazy in the Republican Party. Presumably, they're doing it for a reason. It's up to us to uncover the reason and inquire. And there's nothing inherently illegitimate about someone making that choice. So I would just say, like, I'm not sure how the ignorance frame operates, because who decides? I'm thinking specifically of conversations that happened during COVID where you had you know, an episode of The Daily was quite interesting where you had a doctor in the South in a red state, I forget which one, basically going around pleading with his neighbors to, to stop believing that Bill Gates was going to inject them with a microchip. And, and the level was that, the level of conversation was that these people really believed that the vaccine was a product of Microsoft trying to take control of their bodies. I mean, that's not a citizenry who's ready for um, a distribution of power in, in governing and making deci in decision making. I, it, it, this is America. I mean, well, would you would you disenfranchise them? Would you take their votes away? I mean, I'm at the level where I'm I'm maybe I'm doubting the that democracy really can function in a society like America. I think it can function in smaller, more homogenous societies, but I've lost a lot of faith in. Uh, in the degree to which uh, some of our fellow citizens are productive um, sharers in, in, in governing power and decision making. Okay. How did the French choose? Hit that mic if you would, Emma. Oh, uh, would you please? On the, since we're talking about these committees, how did they go about choosing the people to sit on them? I mean, did, was there a bar they had? To, was there a level of education they had to have? Or? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. So people volunteered? How no. did it work? No, because if you wait for people to volunteer, you have an enormous selection bias. So, no, they, they generated around 300,000 uh, phone numbers, called, I don't know, 80,000 of them, got the demographics, asked ask them if they'd be interested in hearing more and, and joining this um, convention. And then they did some, some stratified random sampling, as it's called, to make sure there was a a fair representation of the you know, salient categories in the population that the French state recognizes. So it would be gender, education levels, uh, geographic origin, uh, dwelling, so urban versus rural, things like that. Uh, we cannot tra track race or ethnicity in, our, in, in France uh, or religion, I believe. So those categories didn't enter the equation. And one thing they did wrong, I think, is that they didn't really check for um, uh, views about the about the climate. So I think the result was that the assembly was a little less climato-skeptic than the larger country. But otherwise, it was you know it was done by Harris. In, I think it's called Harris Interactive, which is a polling agency, and they they did a good job. Can I call a um, a quick audible? Since we have about nine people on the current list, um, can we instead sort of adult learning? Feel free to. Grab a coffee if you need or use the restroom, but let's just push till four o'clock and then we'll break clean. Is that okay? Um, so uh, let's go next. There's a complicated system. Emma, you finish your no, question just, and then we'll go just, to Carl. I was just simply going to ask Thomas. I forget so, I'm yeah. sorry. Do you sorry. think that wouldn't work if that kind of polling, if, if they set it up in the same way in America, rigorously selecting people the way they did in France, you genuinely don't think that would be lead to a, a, a kind of useful discussion? It could lead to a useful discussion. I, I, having lived in France for 11 years, I think that the French are capable of a higher level of discussion, more widely distributed than, than many Americans are. But Thomas, it's already been done in the US. I, mean, I know it has. No, I'm sure it has. So, but, but, and, and the level of conversation was completely fine. So I don't understand what, I mean, empirically. I would love, to see, I would love to see more of what you're talking about. In, in, in my experience as an American, I'm not very optimistic. Google America in one room. Uh, just before 2016 election, America in one room, Jim Tishkin, the professor of communication at Stanford University, 
brought together around 525, I don't know, 35 American citizens in one room for a weekend to talk about energy policy, immigration, all of these things. And there's a whole article in the New York Times, you see the faces of all those people, extremely diverse um, tapestry of faces and ages and all of that. And they converged on some issues, they, the, the polarization decreased. Um, it, it's, I, I mean, Meta's done it online across, um, you know, uh, the user community, uh, uh, you know, so I, I think you can do it anywhere. They've done it in Uganda. They've done it uh, uh, in Mongolia. Mongolia now has a law that says that before any constitutional reform, um, you need to conduct a deliberative poll. So a deliberative poll is a certain type of mini public that is being copyrighted by Jim Fishkin. It's very large, it's quite short. It's the, you know, all these mini publics have different shapes and size and procedures and protocols. But I mean, at this point, I really encourage you to check out the OECD report. You, you see a, a diversity of <coughs> practices and processes and I think for some reason in the US, even though the New York Times covered it, and even though Texas you know, flipped from being the, the next to last on, on um, renewable energies to being the first because of a deliberative poll, somehow all these things are not discussed in the media or um, anywhere really. So it's, it's kind of uh, a bit incomprehensible from my perspective. But I think things are changing. And I, I noticed like, uh, the Boston Review just did a, a long form article on sortition. Um, uh, yeah, I can give you many examples. I think it's changing. All right, there's a complicated system here. We try to honor uh, newcomers. So let's go next to Carl Cannon, uh, the Bureau Chief of Real Car Politics, DC. Um, I, is that on? Yes. I'd like to respectfully disagree with pretty much every word I've heard. So, mm -hmm. from my new friend Aline, my old friend Shadi. I would have thought you would have agreed. No, with, no. Here, oh, okay. In this one, in this one regard, I'm gonna I'm gonna make the proposition that represent U.S. style representative democracy does work um, and does produce good outcomes. I'm going to give a couple of examples, one for you, one for you, then feel free to poke holes in. Um, you mentioned this referendum in Ireland about abortion. Yeah. I remember that. Um, California, where I'm from, has had direct referendums like that since before Ireland was independent from England. Mm -hmm. and, and it didn't always, it, it came in the progressive era under Hiram Johnson. It was aimed to give people the power over the railroad, which was dominating California politics. And it worked for a while, but what happened is it, it, it's easy to manipulate. And what in, in the 1990s, they passed a law cutting your property taxes. And what it did was basically gut local government, created a two bifurcated system it was very unfair to young people. It was a terrible law. Everybody agreed it was bad governance, but it was written in the California Constitution by the will of the people. Direct democracy. You know, no, no legislature would have ever passed a law like that. And um, and then in, 19, in, in the 1990s, there was a referendum passed that would have prevented illegal immigrants in the stat statute of law, mostly Mexican, undocumented people from Mexico, from getting any social benefits, mm. even some people thought that maybe you couldn't even go to public school. It was such a bad law that the California Supreme Court threw it out, but it was passed by the will of the people. So right. wait, you, let me turn to Shadi. So I just want to get it all out. And I, I, I actually agree with most of what you said, Shadi, but I wanted to make one question, which is that, you know, you, you made the, when defining democracy, you know, can it produce good outcomes and you, you know even when it doesn't seem to you defended it but I guess I'd su submit to you that it usually does produce good outcomes and sometimes it takes a while um, I'm thinking now of gay marriage which is an issue I covered and I'm I'm not gay but I'm as I said from California so it was an issue that I knew about because it was relevant to California politics sure. <laughs> No, Say I mean, just enough. Because you had to know about gay politics to cover California politics. Anyway, um, so in, in um, 1991, when Bill Clinton was running for president, I asked him about gay marriage. And he responded as though he'd never even heard of the idea before. That's 1991, and he runs in 1992. He certainly never mentioned it while campaigning. By 2004, this is you know, 12 years later in the election, um, 
Jonathan Rauch has written a book saying why gay, mar gay marriage is good for gays, straights, and America. Um, the, the, Ma the Massachusetts and Hawaii Supreme Court have come close to legalizing it. Um, President George W. Bush has asked about it. I asked him about it myself. And um, pretty soon, before the politicians could even act, the public sort of let its know. A new generation came up, millennials. And they were so in favor of it. It was the, it was the, no pollsters had never seen anything like it. I, I got a thing from Gallup one time from uh, Frank Newport, who was the managing editor of Gallup Poll. And I'm looking at his data and I said, I call him, I said, Frank, Am I looking at your data right? I want to ask you this question. Are evangelical Repu Republican evangelical Christians under the age of 25 more in favor of gay marriage than New Deal Democrats over the age of 65? And he swore, he cussed. I said, oh, did I get that wrong? He said, no, I wish I was. That's perfect. I could have put that in my press release. It was a purely generational issue. These, the younger generation, not Gen Z, millennials, they didn't get the question, man. Do you believe in gay marriage? Like they were missing something. Of course they did. And then there became this race between legislatures, Congress, and the courts who could legalize it faster. It was Supreme Court won, but it was happening. And it was happening because of the will of the people. It took 12 years. But I, I, I submit to you that these, ex, these examples that I'm talking about, direct democracy, it's nice in theory, but it has had problems that we've established in our culture. And representative democracy, you know, it doesn't, it seems frustrating and maddening and people are sitting around this table saying, these, but Carl, 63 million voted for Trump. I'm just, I guess what I'm saying is that democracy was never supposed to be fast. And I guess I'm, I'm the proposition I'm asking you, doesn't, given time, doesn't usually work. So, so like part of the issue here is the example of gay marriage. There are still a big chunk of Americans who don't consider that to be a good outcome. This goes back to my general point that because we can't agree on what constitutes a good outcome in a divided society, some people will always be disappointed with the result of an election, right? So my argument isn't that democracy can't or won't produce good outcomes, it's that it can't be guaranteed to produce good outcomes and it shouldn't depend on that because the danger is if we orient ourselves towards an outcomes focused approach, if we keep on seeing a string of bad outcomes, we're going to lose faith because we have that link. We're going to say, well, if democracy isn't producing good outcomes, why should I be committed to it? And that is a little bit of my concern, you know, Thomas, with your point. If it's all about the outcomes and democracy doesn't produce them, then we can discard democracy. So there has to be some commitment to the procedural mechanisms, regardless of what. So it's basically alternation of power through regular elections. And we don't know if it's going, because I mean, there are cases where democracy doesn't lead to good outcomes for certain groups. Like, so for example, I, you know, if you're a minority in say um, Israel or, in, or India, or, you know, you might say, well, okay, um, the national culture, the civilizational orientation is being voted each time and my minority side can't seem to win, then you say, what's the point of democracy if it keeps on leading? I mean, there's just a number of ways that it just might not work out in the way that you want it to. And not everyone's willing to wait for 15 to 20 years. Let's say you only have five years left to live. You might say, well, yeah, it'll work out in 15 years, but I'm concerned about the time when I'm alive. How does that, you know, so yeah, that would just be my, but. So Carl, I just want to clarify, politics without politicians, it's not politics without representatives. I'm not advocating for direct democracy. I don't think the California model is good because it's based on basically a citizen's initiative, the result of which goes straight to a ballot. There's no deliberation. The, the, the initiative can be totally bought and manipulated by corporations. That's not good. I'm talking about a different model where you have deliberation among a representative sample, you know, so it's deliberative, slow, thoughtful, and then you go to the referendum once you've got the framework right. And so it involves citizens in different ways, but it's not like, it's not as capturable, if you want, as, as the, uh, the Californian model. But that said, I, I, there are you know, economists out there who've done some studies of uh, the California model, and it's not that bad. You can point you know, one or, or two or three or a number of bad results, but apparently on average, it's actually not that bad. So. Uh, Let's go next, if we can, to Peter Frankopan. 
Worcester College, Oxford. Uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting. I've got a sort of a, a question that always puzzles me that maybe maybe you can help me with, which is why when we have discussions of democracy, does Athens always get mentioned? I mean, it tells us tells me a great deal about how we configure the world and the selective sure, that's true. editing of, of an intellectual glory day. And if you can answer that, can you explain also perhaps why, what are the lessons we should learn from the failure of democracy in Athens? It doesn't last very long. Is dismantled and is um, extremely unsuccessful. And I suppose my question in there, apart from that's a sort of a slightly um, unfair question, maybe, is it would seem to me that, that we have to distinguish between these big headline questions, you know, Brexit, abortion, gay marriage, you know, foreign interventions in wars, and you know, biodiversity or federal programs around you know transportation, you know, all the kind of unglamorous things that governments do. Um, is there a, is there a worry that that we, we throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and try and think about the headline things about what's wrong rather than, as Carl said, the, the many, many things that go right that are unsung and we don't pay attention to. So that, that's one question. The second one, and unless I'm mistaken, um, neither um, Helene or, or Shaggy mentioned the word inequality, unless I'm mistaken. If you did, it was much in passing. That would seem to me the starting point around what any problems are around any political system, and in particular, with democracy. I wonder if you could both say a few words about where inequality fits within the benefits or problems of democracy in your conceptualizations of what that means. Do you want to start? Or? Yeah, sure. So actually, thank you for bringing that point about Greece, because I also feel very, I, I for, in this, you know, for the sake of time, I didn't want to go into the origins of democracy, but I, I, I take your point. I, I could have mentioned just as well, you know, Mesopotamian kingdom of, of Mari, or like, you know, the, the sort of uh, Indian village practices of local democracy or uh, the Huron tribes or that predate, I mean, some of them predate uh, ancient Greece and it's true, it's very Western centric and all that. That said, uh, and I read the book by David Stasavage on you know, the, the, the rise and fall of democracy, it, it has not that much detail about how they worked and none of them, as far as I know, worked based on random selection. That seemed to be that seems to be a distinctive. Um, Sorry, I, I don't mean. Is that not true? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't mean just the list of where one could start and one could pick Mesopotamian yeah. kingdoms. I think it's the context of contemporary intellectuals framing contemporary problems with reference to the past. So it's the use of history uh, in, in a way that perhaps doesn't help these kinds of conversations. Because I can promise you, ancient Athens, ancient Mesopotamian, Indus Valley kingdoms, where there or Indus Valley states rather, where there's very low levels of inequality, function in completely different ways to societies today. So. It's about whether we as intellectuals frame arguments in ways that are highly exclusive, because when we'll start talking about Athenian democracy, you lose the people who are chosen by lot. You've got no idea about Pericles or the Peloponnesian Wars or ancient Athens, ancient Mesopotamia. So it's not the specific choice of a Western-centric vision, although I do have quite a strong opinion about that too. It's about the idea that these ancient models were not very robust. So why do we bring them into the debate to try oh. to say this is a model that we should follow? Well, they were not very robust. I mean, it, you know, what can you conclude from one one failure? You need a lot of data points to understand. Well, I mean, I not, none of the regimes back then were very, 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 very resilient I'll, anyway. I'll, so. I'm, I'm, I'm a guest, so I, I will say one more thing, and then I will shut up. Yeah. I promise until tomorrow. Empire is a very resilient form of government over thousands of years of histories. Democracies are not. So with Shadi's point about Adams and Madison, these were people who were classicists, they were racists, they were trying to preserve slavery, etc. as well. They weren't interested in minority rights. But these models work, have worked much better. So the deflection of towards something that has proven to be not particularly resilient is quite an interesting question, I think. OK, I'd love to continue that conversation. I'm not sure empire counts as a regime. It's, uh, anyway, autocracy does, and it's not that resilient either. So I just, I don't know. We can, we can take that to, you know, to dinner or something. Um, what was uh, inequality? Well, I think, I mean, inequality in my books is a very central feature. I, I, I mentioned equality now, not inequality. But definitely what I see as a big flaw of electoral democracy that is systematically favors the rich. I mean, you know, like I have colleagues, Gillens and Page, who have demonstrated that the public policies in the US are um, more or less causally determined by the preferences of the richest 10%, you know. And everyone else gets what they want by coincidence when their preference happen to match the preferences of the richest 10%. I think it's a huge problem and huge factor of instability. Explains populism, um, explains the, the Trump movement, the Yellow Vest movements. I think it's central. 
Okay, so, so I, I, I don't think it's central. So oh, that's maybe... You, um, so I'm also... I think, obviously, there are different definitions and interpretive approaches to democracy. But it's interesting that, you know, you really emphasize equality. I would see consent as the organizing principle, not equality. Um, I mean, there's nothing, even in thicker definitions from political scientists uh, of, of democracy, the economic content is not part of any mainstream definition of democracy. Democracy is agnostic towards ultimate economic outcomes. So if a d democracy produces greater economic inequality, that is not the, that is not the fault of, that's not what democracy is supposed to address. There is equality in the sense of citizenship and the right to vote. That's what universal suffrage is about. But what it sounds like, but sometimes people extend that to say equality of outcome. Democracy doesn't, and in my view, shouldn't guarantee any kind of equality of outcome. It does give people the quality of opportunity in terms of registering their disagreements, voting for one party or the other, protesting, criticizing the government. Everyone does have the right to do that in a democracy. Um, so, I mean, if, if we want better economic outcomes where we close the gap on inequality, then voters have to vote for leftist parties that make that part of their agenda. That is up to voters, if that makes sense. So we sort of touched on the ideal of Athens, not the boring part of the sort of uh, bureaucrats in the corner who are running this stuff that's not interesting in terms of politics, but this inequality thing, we kind of got it. Did we get it enough? And let's go to Katrin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, in my reporting, I would certainly agree with Peter. I mean, inequality, whether that's, you know, of economic well-being or of respect, of dignity, is, is a driver, in my view, of, of political outcomes. But I want to come back to what Shadi said. I thought that was fascinating, this idea of minimalist democracy. I find it super scary, uh, almost like you're resigned to the bad outcomes. And as a German, I will say, you know, the right to make the wrong choice, as you put it. I mean, in Germany, it led in Weimar Germany, it led to Hitler, and then it led to the Holocaust. So I just want to make the point that you know, the enemies of democracy will use democracy as much as they can. And we're seeing that play out in real life right now. I think to Carl's point, I also am a believer in the march of progress. I think we've seen that. It goes in fits and starts. And I think if only we had that time, I would trust the next generation. I mean, I have children myself. They're much smarter than I am on a lot of these issues. They're much more relaxed, by the way, on a lot of these issues, you know, where we get ourselves into knots about wokeism. And anyhow, they just, they just kind of get on with it. I believe in that. Uh, but I fear the time could, but we might not have the time that we might run out of time and it must be it could be a very small chance but it's possibly not worth taking that risk so i would posit that rather than athens we should possibly look to germany which is kind of ground zero in some ways because of the holocaust and the institutions in germany i think are really worth looking at because they were designed in the wake of the holocaust we have something called wehrhafte demokratie defense of democracy it's a system which acknowledges that you know, which, which basically acknowledges that we lost democracy through democracy. Hitler was elected, you know, in a coalition. And so in a way, what it's saying is that you don't have unlimited rights. You know, we have, we have a very powerful intelligence service that can ban political parties, that can, you know, survey political parties. We have a system by which you cannot run around with a swastika like you can in Charlottesville because, you know, that incites hatred and could be a threat to democracy. We acknowledge that you have rights in a liberal democracy, but you can forfeit them. So it's a balance because, of course, a democracy has to make, make sure that it doesn't undermine itself. But I think we should, <coughs> in both of your visions, and I think your vision is very interesting as a complement, not as a replacement of representative mm -hmm. democracy, because I think voting itself is, is an act of agency that's very important at an age where people don't feel much agency. But I do feel that both of your visions possibly <coughs> require a deep rethink of almost the design, the institutional design of democracy, which is clearly failing us in the several countries. Look, so I'd say, first of all, there are very few examples of one person, one vote, one time. Um, the reason that Germany comes up so much is it's literally one of the only examples people can come up with. It's extremely rare. And actually, one person, one vote time, one vote, one time was coined in regards to the Middle East about the fear of Islamist parties coming to power only to end democracy as we know it. And one of the arguments I make here is that that never actually happened. It's a completely fictional scenario. It could have happened, theoretically, anything is possible, 
But if we look at the empirical record, this actually is very rare. It's never happened in a consolidated democracy. Um, the closest example you can get to is Hungary, which isn't even a consolidated democracy. It wasn't. It's a fairly um, young democracy from the early 1990s. That's the closest thing that we have to subverting democracy from within in the European context, you know, in, in the in the post-war period. Um, and look, I think I don't want to get into like a debate about whether Hitler was elected. I, I do sort of I don't love it because it's not 100 percent true. He was appointed as chancellor by President Hindenburg. Hindenburg was under no constitutional obligation to appoint Hitler in 1932. But he, well, he wasn't democratically elected, though. We, we can maybe debate on that, but just to say, but um, if Germany is really, if and I have a little bit of an issue. I hear Hitler comparisons perpetually from my colleagues and friends on the left side of the spectrum. Americans have lost their political imagination where their only relevant analogy is something that happened 90 years ago. Why is Germany, so at, forget about Athens, why is Germany relevant to America? And I pose this question, I never get an answer. Why are we looking at the rise of Hitler to explain American politics? Because Germany had democracy and then lost But why, but why? But why is okay? But why is that specific example that relevant to the? Yeah, no, why is that relevant to the U.S.? I mean, Weimar Germany was a young democracy. Um, it was a completely different interwar context, and to kind of try to replicate the Weimar model and say Weimar tells us something about 2020 America, I think it's used to delegitimize one's opponents when you use the fascism card. When you bring up Hitler, it's a way to say that your opponents are beyond the pale and that they have to be destroyed because they are fascist. And that is what a lot of people were saying about the entire chunk of MAGA Republicans. You're basically delegitimizing your fellow citizens. That's how, so there's a risk of using the threat of fascism to undermine. So yeah. what does Germany do? Germany surveils parties that are beyond the pale. I think that's anti-democratic. Should there be okay. an intelligence service that decides who's a good party and who's a bad who's a bad party, and the state intervenes in that? That's also frightening to me. Sure, sure. Let's go to Maureen Khan of the Economics Editor at the Times next, and then we'll go to Rachel. Okay. Hi. Uh, I just want to talk about um, so in Europe the the dual way that politics is conducted at the national level, but also the supranational level, and the European Union, and. So your bad outcomes thing is, is has a direct comparison with this idea of output legitimacy, which is the idea that the European Union, whose democratic credentials have been uh, fragile at best, so it has to rely on the notion of output legitimacy. So it might not be very democratic, but it gets good stuff done. So that's why we need the European Union. And that output legitimacy thing, a bit like your bad outcomes things, was massively discredited during the financial crisis. So now we no longer, or scholars no longer rely on output legitimacy as the thing to, to tell people why the European Union is good. Um, and one of the things that, so when you were speaking about how maybe Muslims in France or minorities might try and win the democratic argument to overturn some things that they think are going against them, one of the things that lots of uh, activists, especially uh, sort of uh, equality activists, uh, racial justice activists, think that the European Union will ultimately be the bulwark to protect them when their nation states go a bit nasty, because we have this supranational level, which is there for us uh, as something that we can take recourse to to protect us. And, and sadly, the story of the last few years has been the European Union doesn't get involved and says, sorry, we don't interfere in the, in the, into the manners of our nation states. And uh, if there is a French separatism law, then sorry, but you just got to deal with it. And maybe my final thing, one thing we haven't really spoken about is the trappings of democracy and the sort of checks and balances. So you spoke a lot about the executives and parliaments, but there's also a role for courts. Um, the European Court of Justice is probably the least scrutinized but most important institution of the European Union. And we've seen many examples in the last few years of people appealing to the European Court of Justice when they think that a member state has done something to undermine their fundamental rights. So also at the European Court of Justice and also at the European Court of Human Rights, which is not part of the European Union per se. And I just wanted to bring this up because, because of this headscarf issue and, and by stealth almost, and with nobody even noticing, the European Court of Justice has rejected a lot of the claims of Muslim women who are fighting against their employers who tell them that they can't wear the hijab and has come up with a series of uh, judgments and de facto written constitutional law in Europe, 
which actually has created this, this notion of neutrality and what it means to be a neutral person in the workplace or a neutral citizen in Europe. And by virtue of various judgments, it's come out in a, we've come out into a place where a Muslim woman, because of the fact that she might cover her head, is not a neutral citizen in the European Union. So if our notion of neutrality is probably those guys in the ECJ think you're a man, you're probably white, and you're probably Christian, then that's neutral. Someone who doesn't conform to that falls under this non-neutral status. And effectively, I mean, these are not things that get too much attention, but that is now de facto gives carte blanche to any employer across Europe to tell a woman what they cannot, cannot wear under the guise of neutrality. And I've actually read these judgments, and I have to say, unlike the Supreme Court, which gets a lot of political attention, I would say that nobody at the European Court of Justice understands the basic anything about what Islam is and what the headscarf means about what role it plays in society. They kind of provide a very, I think, come with a very Christian view about what religion and religious symbols and conspicuous religious symbols these things just really don't apply in the Muslim context. And we've de facto created a notion of citizenship across the European Union, which will exclude your biggest religious minority from showing the basic elements of their religious consciousness, which can include clothing. And for somebody who wants to overturn these things, which you can maybe in France, it's such a high barrier for anyone to then try and say, how do we overturn what has become a now hardwired legal concept of what a citizen looks like based on the rulings of the European Court of Justice? Now, if, and that, it's a very dispiriting message to people who want to change the course of their, you know, who want to change things that happen in France or Sweden. Or, it's uh, probably a shadow. Yeah, it and it's more of a comment, but I, it, yeah. I think it's worth noticing because actually these things go very much unscrutinized more than, yeah. you know, the Le Pens of this world and builders. Like by stealth, we are creating, I think, some very pernicious definitions about what it means to be European and what it means to be a citizen of Europe. Yeah, well, this I think, you know, um, it reinforces a major concern that I have that when people rely on courts for basic rights first of all it's a misplaced hope and you don't you don't want to depend on an institution that that can't actually deliver and we've seen as you say the Euro european court of justice european court of human rights have been pretty you know have been bad from my perspective on uh, the hijab issue and the issue of neutrality which goes to show that even supranational um these kinds of technocratic elite bodies, neutrality is impossible. Everyone has an ideological bias. Every institution has an ideological bias. There is, we will never find neutrality in this world and the courts can offer it. And I saw how for a long time, you know, Democrats and liberals in America, we believed that the Supreme Court was the bulwark for fundamental rights. But when, you put faith in an institution like that and the and the uh, composition of the Supreme Court changes and leans in the other direction. And now we see that you can't depend on courts for that. And now you see how Democrats are being a little bit inconsistent. They were happy about the counter majoritarianism of the Supreme Court 10 years ago when it was supporting left leaning goals. Now they say that these unelected conservatives are going against the popular will on certain moral issues, on abortion, gay marriage, whatever it might be. So, you know, no one's being consistent, obviously, because everyone is outcomes oriented. So a big part of what I want, like what I hope people can rethink is to be conscious of their outcome orientation and then correct for that. Because we all do it perpetually. We don't even realize it. Very good. Let's go if we can, unless you want a quick way in. Let's go to uh, Rachel. A quick way in. No, I, I I, I think I, I see the two sides of the debate here, and I, I have to say, I think we should distinguish between different things. One is like the need for maybe the constitutionalization of certain rights, because we've learned from history that majorities make mistakes and that they come to regret those mistakes. The Athenians didn't have that, and then they suffered dearly for it. So one of the lessons, again, of the Athenian example, that maybe it's not bad to have a entrenched rights that are not easy to, to, to change or violate. Does that mean they should be there forever, untouchable, and only supreme justices have a right to say anything about their meaning? No. Um, that I think the, the middle ground is to say, look, we're going we're gonna to tie our, our, ourselves to the mass, like Ulysses, not to be tempted by the sirens. You know, that's a vision of constitutions put forward by Yonessa, for example. But at the same time, we have to be able to untie the knots when they're no longer serving us. So how do we build in the possibility of constitutional amendments when certain rights stop being justified or fit the, the times? Or, and I think, for example, the American Constitution went too far 
locking up the, the constitution and throwing the key. It's almost impossible now to, to change it. The French constitution is also very hard to change. Um, the Belgian constitution is very easy to change. I, th I, I think there's, so yeah, so I think we don't have to choose one camp or the other. You can protect rights at the same time, not give up on, on evolution and changes that are, respond to democratic mm -hmm. preferences. Can I just chuck in a tiny, yeah. tiny yeah. clarification yeah. question here? Because I, I think, are there, I mean, this, this goes back to kind of what I said earlier, but are there inalienable rights? Are there things that should never, ever be changed? I mean, the German constitution is very clear on this. Liberal, and the liberal is definitely included, liberal, democratic, the, the liberal, the rights of liberal, the concept of liberal democracy and of the rule of law cannot be touched. Nobody can vote, like voted in or out or whatever. Like mm. that is a premise of this defense of democracy. So I'm wondering, is there such thing or do you think democracy, anything goes, you can, you can shut out anything but you democracy want. Democracy can't be imposed. It's like love. You can't impose democracy on a fascist public. It won't work. What, what will force them? Hitler rose to power because there were 3 million SR people in the streets, not because of the question what the courts were doing about rights. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, well, it's a good bumper sticker, no, I, by the I, way. I Democracy is like love. I, 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 just to yes, clarify yes. something. Yeah, yeah. So um, in, in the minimalist conception of democracy, there still is some overlap with political liberalism. So when we talk about culture, religion, identity, I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic on those, whatever, whatever people want in their particular context. But for competition to be fair, for there to be real contestation, you have to have the right to protest, the right to criticize um, the ruling party. You need to have some level of freedom of expression because if you can't communicate your preferences to voters, then they won't have an actual choice. So that is that's kind of that's that's built in. Now um, and and obviously you know you know if you disenfranchise a minority, then the country would no longer be a democracy. So there's there's just the basic franchise as well. So it's not anything goes. It's all it's anything goes within a constitutional framework. So I'm not calling for the U.S. Constitution to change. That has democratic consent. We can change it if we have enough people in states. We don't. So that is the constitution that we work with, and that provides the contours, but we don't agree on how to interpret those contours, right? So I think that's, that's part of the challenge here. Um, but to give you an example of what, what wouldn't be protected, um, cultural illiberalism, let's say. So let's say that a democratic elected parliament votes to um, restrict abortion or to institute a blasphemy law where you can't insult prophets and divine texts, let's say in a religiously conservative society, or let's say that a parliament makes it harder for women to initiate divorce proceedings. Those can all be morally objectionable or even abhorrent things, but they don't have, they're not intrinsically related to democratic competition. Those are, pref those are social preferences and they either reflect the majority or they don't. See, the, the latter, for a woman not to have the same rights as a man to initiate divorce, for me, is anti-liberal in the sort of, that, that to me undermines liberal <coughs> democracy. Well, but that's the whole point. Not every democracy has to be liberal. Well, I would contest that because well, I think, you, as you just said yourself a minute ago, it wouldn't stop being a democracy if you disenfranchise a minority, didn't you? Well, because they wouldn't have the right to vote. The well, okay, you're just talking about disenfranchisement in the sense of voting. Yeah. But what about equality of rights? But we don't have that in, okay, not to, I don't want to cause a controversy, but we don't have that in France. <laughs> I don't think, uh, we don't have that in, in Israel. I mean, Arabs are not equal citizens um, in Israel. They have rights, but it's not, you know, there are issues there. So um, does that mean that these countries are not democratic? Um, it's not a liberal democracy. Well, right. Yeah. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that we have to leave open the possibility that some populations will choose an illiberal course. And they already have. We've seen it across the world. Yeah. I'm sorry, but in Please. France, uh, the more so as we cannot ask, we cannot ask citizens either about their religion or about their uh, ethnic group, any citizen has equal rights, as far as the law is concerned, as far as the constitution is concerned. But not minorities. To, to of course. The convention, Sorry? To sign the, the framework convention for the protection of national minorities. 
was a big controversy over there. When you are a French citizen, whatever your religion, whatever your origin, you have equal rights. Okay, but that's contested. I mean, I, I get that. I understand that that's your position. No, a lot it's not of people, a position. No, it's a fact. No, but I mean, here's the here, moment here, where he, facts no, no, have to be taken no, no, into but here, account. But facts, but book. facts are embedded. Even in, about Athenian no. democracy, where, if I may remind you, women were not allowed to vote. I didn't say anything about Athens, no, so no, don't no, put. No, it's <laughs> just a joke. Yeah, but okay, but a if, joke well, I mean, fa but this is why facts are embedded in values and worldviews. So what you're saying, I disagree factually about what you just said, but that's not because we disagree on the reality. We disagree on how to interpret the reality based on our first principles and our value commitments. We have different ways of looking at the world, including freedom of religion. Um, okay, um, French Muslim citizens, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them would, would firmly and, and vociferously disagree with the characterization that they have uh, completely equal rights. So are, is their view not legitimate? Who's right? Who adjudicates that question? No, I'm talking about legal rights. I'm not talking about the way people but, No, I'm not talking about feeling. I'm talking about the, the 2004 law on conspicuous religious symbols is to me uh, has a disproportionate impact on Muslims and therefore Muslim women in particular do not have equal rights. To you, you just said yeah. it. You, you, you well, yeah, that's it the whole point. Well. It that's seems a, to you, yeah, in it's the not French a fact. tradition, whether we like it or not, for historical reasons, that is what in our democracy, secularism is a pillar of our system. That's the way it is. The way it is applied, the way people may resent that, and especially Muslim women who feel that they have to abide by customs more so than by religion, but that's another debate. Uh, it's another issue. But as far as the law is concerned, as far as the constitution is concerned, these are facts. Now, the way one looks at it or one feels about it, feels about it, that's something else. But none of us are neutral. So you're, you're so I guess I would say we're, we're all non neutral in different ways, even if we think we're being neutral, there's just no way to avoid that. In my so I think that, well, that sort of supports my point facts, we can't even agree on how we like reality, we can't even agree on a baseline of reality on existential questions. So we have to suspend judgment and let go somehow and agree that we're not going to be able to find a definitive resolution. But anyway, it's a uh, yeah. Oh, and it's, it's a good reminder. What was your best quote from Chantal Mouffe about democracy is supposed to bring out conflict? Yeah, yeah. We're doing all right, guys. We're doing oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and it's G.K. Testerson, uh, like a jolly hostess, is supposed to bring shy people out. Come on, keep speaking up. Uh, uh, Rachel Donadio from The Atlantic. Hi, no, this is fascinating. The conversation has taken so many turns since I formulated my question. Um, I'm not gonna get into the laicite thing. I will say that that law is about um, public school and public spaces. It's mm. not like you could, it's not about the streets. And, yeah. and let me just plug space. real public quick. If you have not, not read Rachel's spaces. piece in The Atlantic so. about a year ago on laicite, mm. it's a long form piece. It's lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a hard question. Uh, so I, I, I was really inspired and, and provoked by, by both of your, your comments, Ellen and, and Shadi. I have to say that I live in Paris, vote in Brooklyn. The only sport I follow is Italian politics, and that is a real laboratory for, for populism. And I grew up in Vermont, which is famous for its town meetings, which are these very quaint assemblies where everyone gets together and talks about things. And I remember going to these in high school, and sometimes my town would say, oh, you know, whoever showed up at the meeting, it would be, well, I think we're going to cut the social services budget, but we'll build a new tennis court. You know, and it was really dependent on who, who showed up. So I'm also a journalist, so I'm slightly cynical about certain things, or maybe that's why I'm a journalist. But I, I want to ask. A, a, a more nuts and bolts question that connects to, I think, both of, of what Ellen and, and Shadi were saying um, about these citizen assemblies. One thing that strikes me about France, it's the strongest, Macron, or the presidency of France is one of the strongest positions in Europe, stronger than the German chancellor, certainly stronger than any Italian leader just because of the structure of that. And yet it seems like the assemblies were, his, his opposition was essentially the street and not so much a political opposition. So these, the idea of these citizens' assemblies was a way 
of, of somehow letting some steam out to mm -hmm. see um, if there if there couldn't be just open open conflict in Italy and I'm curious what Mattia thinks about this in the 2018 elections the results of those elections were a very very strange populist government that included this five-star movement which is essentially a citizens assembly that is a party and it wound up being extraordinarily untransparent the decisions taken by what was then the largest party in parliament were all done in this like weird closed door online system held in a database that's privately owned and so i'm somewhat skeptical about you know institutionalizing citizens assemblies but i guess and, and also as to shadi's conversation earlier about economics and national identity. My experience from having covered the Euro crisis is you get these questions of national identity and who are we when governments and politicians have less room to maneuver on economics. And I think the Euro crisis and the idea of the Euro, like, well, we're kind of stuck, so there's not so much we can do. So we're gonna have to double down on who we are as opposed to you know, what politicians can control. My main question in this is we're talking about democracy and big questions like that. How much of this is actually the weakness of party politics and parties to actually address the currents in society and what people are, are feeling? I mean, I think some of these mainstream centrist parties have collapsed in a way because they haven't been able to adapt quickly enough. But that does that mean we need to do away with parties? Or does that mean that parties maybe need to renovate themselves? And, and I wonder what, what both of you think of, think of that. Just quick on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Throw in a quick question, yes, yeah. which uh, piggybacking on it. Do, do either of you have a preference on a parliamentary versus a pre presidential form of democracy? Okay, I, I, I can start. Uh, just very. I'll just be quick on this. Um, so I think that's one of the criticisms of the EU that it's it's taken away economic management and it's it has um, straight jacketed elected politicians. They are constrained by EU rules and regulations. So it's no longer a product of democratic decision making. So in some ways that encourages, as you're suggesting, I think, it encourages moving to culture and identity issues because that is what states have considerable jurisdiction over. So that is like, I think, one of the unanticipated dark sides of EU economic regulation. Um, and then, um, on parties, look, uh, parties parties kind of suck, but they're also better than. I mean, here's the problem. I mean, every every a lot of citizens of democracy, democracies think their democracy is the worst, um, and it, I think there's something encouraging about that. You talk to Brits, Americans, Swedes, Italians, like you'll always find someone who's like my situation um, is the worst, and that's why. But I worry that. You know, in trying to come up with completely different institutional designs, we're creating a whole set of new unanticipated consequences. We don't know what what will happen if we go down the route of full on citizen assemblies. And I have to say, as bad as America is, I don't know if I want to mess with the formula. We got to So, you know, it's kind of I think that America has been working pretty well relatively speaking. So do we want to mess with that and try something completely new? I don't know if I'm comfortable with that, but on, uh, but I would say if I could choose, I'd choose a parliamentary system over a presidential because we know that parliamentary systems lower the stakes because you don't have one figurehead or one person and you can build coalition governments. There are weaknesses, but if I had to choose, that's what I would lean towards for America, but obviously it's too late. <laughs> So we also choose a parliamentary system over a presidential system, your questions. Um, I, I can't let you say that the Five Star Movement is like a citizen's assembly. It's absolutely not the same. I mean, it's based on self-selection. Uh, I don't know the exact sociology of the Five Star Movement, but I, I'm not sure the shy are well represented. Uh, or or I, it's not like it's whoever shows up is the more vocal, the more disillusioned. You won't get a fair sample of the population when you self-select like that it's a definition it's it's probably closer to the yellow yellow vest movement i suspect so they, they perform a function but i don't think it's the same at all uh, on the role of parties i think they've become rent seeking machines and that's why they've lost their popular support and they rule the void as um you know the, the mayor said um of their roles in modern democracies 
what rules would they have in, a, in an open democracy? It's a question I get asked a lot. I, I think they should be like think tanks, um, you know, organizations that mobilize around issues that continue performing the very useful function of uh, delineating uh, platforms and visions for, you know, coherent policy sets, for example. But I don't see why they should be the machines through which people get to power. First of all, because their, their own functioning is very undemocratic. It's opaque, it's, uh, it's nepotistic, it's all of that. Then when you send people from those kind of uh, uh, associations to power, I'm not sure you get the, the right types if you want. Uh, if you manage to climb the party hierarchy, I think it's not necessarily a sign that you're fit to, to rule, actually. So I would, I mean, I, Nancy Rosenblum said, well, why don't we choose randomly from party membership? Actually, that might be better than nothing, but it's still not my ideal. I think there should be no correlation between your capacity to, you know, be a party member, run a campaign, and, and uh, your, 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 your right to access power. Great. Um, yeah. Great. Let's go to Mattia for our receipt from the money. Thank you. Now, on, for, for Shadi, I think the, the conversation we were touching upon right before I think is, is interesting and, and, and I think I'm sympathetic with your argument for democratic minimalism. Um, I'm, I'm with you on that, I think, and I'm not sure how far you're ready to go or you're going in the book because I'm, I'm sure you, you wrote a lot about it and thought a lot about it in sort of getting to the point in which that we just touched, I think, which is about the content and neutrality of, of the democratic system and of liberal democracy or meaning to the point in which the ideal of democracy is being completely devoided of any content, which is, I think, interesting. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I want your, your take on this, how far you are going into, for example, deconstructing uh, liberal democracy as we know it, which is, I think, in my, that's my view, is very, you know, Rawlsian type of liberal democracy. Uh, which I think it does have a specific content in terms of the sort of the anthropological premises and the worldview that it poses implicitly. Although at the same time, one of the main feature of uh, that that version of that 19th, the 20th century version of liberal democracy is to claim to be neutral. I mean, that's essential to its existence. It, it, it does have to have certain set of ideas, but to present themselves as sort of the basic state of humanity and not just my my own preference because it is exactly predicated on the idea of like sort of harmonizing like a, a, a in a pluralistic way different ideas of what a good life is so I, i'm I, I, it seems that you are going in that direction of criticism i'm not sure how far because i think it gets pretty uh, radical and uh, radical in the, in the generic sense i mean radical in the sense of like really fundamental, like like criticizing like liberal, not democracy in general, but this breed of liberal democracy, this specific breed of liberal democracy that as a, as a built in feature as the fact of presenting itself as neutral in terms of content. Do, does that make sense? Yeah, how, how far are you going to go on that road? I can, I can, <laughs> I guess, tell you a bit, um, but so I totally agree. Liber liberalism is not neutral, and I'm glad to see that there's an emerging consensus that liberalism has ideological content. It, it offers up a particular conception of the good. And that's precisely why I don't think liberalism should, um, should be so defining and constraining, because illiberal people are limited if in a liberal regime. So what do you do about post-liberals, non-liberals, anti-liberals? Are they going to feel like they can fully participate and have their views reflected and heard? What if you have a country where the majority are non-liberals, but you have a liberal elite that is basically imposing an artificial consensus on the populace? What do you do about that? That gets back to these fundamental questions of consent. If you're basically compelling people to be liberals, against their consent or without their consent, then to me, that is a democratic breach. Now, how far you go, it's not really for me to say, because every society will come up with different guardrails. There's no such thing. I mean, if you have a constitution, there won't be tyranny of the majority. That's 
always what people say could happen, but no one is actually arguing for a completely um, like unfettered majority rule. We all believe in constraints somewhere. We just disagree on where to draw the line and how democratic that line should be, right? Um, so I guess that's what I would say within the, so when it comes to, I think post liberals in America should organize and if they take over the Republican party and that's the vision they wanna promote, we're gonna have to live with that as long as they don't break the law. In other words, they can't commit violence and do things like, you know, yeah. So, so, so you're saying that you're, you're open to an idea where uh, under the democratic umbrella, you have like radically different experiments. But how, and I mean. No, how, rad radically different meaning in, in terms of outcomes, in terms of outcomes. Well, I don't know, that's an interesting question. How radically different would those outcomes be? How radically different would a post-liberal Republican party actually be? I think they're weak on policy. They have a lot of rhetoric about the nation and Christianity and all these things. But when you actually ask them, tell me about your anti-liberal or non-liberal vision. And I've asked some of the post-liberals this. And I remember, and you know, it's public so I can say it, but you know, I asked Sora Bamari, who's one of the major Catholic integralist voices now on the right. So I'm like, listen, I, I get the rhetoric. I see, where, I see the diagnosis that why you don't like liberalism. So sketch out what your alternative is for me. And he struggled. He came up, I think he only came up with three policy proposals um, on the spot. He basically said Sunday laws. That was his main policy proposal, which I'm okay with. No. Yeah, but I yeah. think that, you know, when you push people to actually think beyond this, it's really hard to come up with genuine alternatives because the state itself has a secularizing logic. It constrains people. So I wonder, they can push, but I think there's sort of built in limits. And there aren't a lot of new ideas. Right. Like post-liberalism isn't developed as an alternative system yet. Yeah, the only, the only sorry, if I, if I may. No, the only one I think uh, saying something, which I think is an interesting question, I think Adrian Vermeule uh, in that sense, like is, as far as I know from the right, uh, one of the few that produced like sort of like substantial ideas, like yeah. the idea of common good constitutionalism, that, that to me is completely like, like, wrong I, I disagree with that uh, because for example i mean it posit the, the fact that the state should have like a, a big role and even like introduce i, I don't know like christianity as a as a religion of the state for example yeah. is, is really going in that direction well, this is the whether this, yeah. this is feasible or not is a well this is the great thing about democracy there just simply aren't enough catholic integralists for any of this to happen <laughs> <laughs> right Right. No, no, no. That, that's what I'm saying. Except in Rome, where that, that's exactly right. the, I think was my question. Like theoretically, theoretically, that that could be like possible. Like, well, that, yeah. I mean, yeah. Islamist oh, yeah. parties is a whole other conversation because they do win majorities. They are able to win free and fair elections, and they do have an alternative program. Now, I think they're still constrained for a lot of reasons we can't get into, and we can talk about examples where Islamists have come to power and what they've done. But even there the modern state makes it hard to do certain things. There's also like deep states and, I mean, the, the term deep state was imported from the Middle East and now is used to describe issues in Western democracy. So we were ahead of the game there. That's good. Should it, if you, excuse me, if you sit at Shadi's table tonight, you might get a little more, uh, a little bit below the surface on a lot of this. It's just a wet the appetite. Uh, which by the way is an offsite dinner at La Mesa, uh, which is a restaurant uh, in town. And so it'll mean a 620 departure from the hotel lobby. But let's go to, to Reem, please. Thank you both for your presentations. Um, I will try to be mindful of time. Uh, two quick remarks and uh, a, a question. Um, we can go on and on and on on liberalism, illiberalism, substantive equality, formal equality, and so on and so forth. But a couple of things real quick. Just a tiny precision about the law of 2004. It was for public schools. Yeah, I think I said public education or state public institution. Public schools, yeah, yeah. Uh, until secondary, uh, uh, until the lycée, so high school, yeah. through high school. Yes, and they tried, and I think it's important because they could do it in public schools for historical reasons and so on, etc. But indeed, it opened the door uh, to try to ban it uh, in the public square. But the thing is that we not use laïcité because the original meaning of laïcité would not make the citizen neutral, even though that's what we are trying to do. 
uh, they used public order, which I think speaks volume about the state of our democracy when we are seeing civil liberties through the, the uh, security prism, the security lens, and this is when problems arise. Uh, also regarding the European courts, uh, whether it's on the EU level or the European Convention, uh, it's actually really sad because when it comes to the European Convention, uh, basically the court is not doing its job. Uh, beautiful principles, but when it comes indeed to questions regarding Muslims, they use the margin of appreciation uh, given to the state. And it's so funny when you read the decision, they do like, yeah, there are issues, but uh, we'll let the state deal with it because for political reasons here, not even legal ones, they'd rather have the state within the convention than leaving it. So it's political opportunism, and the CGEU had a chance to had a, um, a chance had an opportunity to rectify it and did not got like cold feet for the same reason. So we shall see where it's going. But anyway, um, Shadi, you scared me. Uh, no, yeah. I, I'm French. Uh, we are in Europe, and um, when you said um, why the U.S. should care about Germany, honestly, I felt. We are in France, right? And we have a dark past when it comes to this stuff. And uh, the far right is that close in France. For me, the far right somehow is already in power. I mean, the party is not, but the narrative and the ideology is. And right now, the far right is going to propose an amendment on birth rate. I'm sorry? Birth rate. Oh, birth rate. It's not yeah. going to go anywhere, right? It's, it won't pass, but it would plant the seed. And Right, weirdly enough, it's at the same time about like the debate around the constitutionalization of abortion. It's not a coincidence. We are going back in a certain time I really don't want to go back to. Um, Eric Zemmour, Marine Le Pen, and all of the mainstream parties who are copying the narrative because it's appealing for many reasons that are up to debate. So when I hear why the US should care, because Shadi, it can happen again. It's already happening again. To be clear, I say U.S. should care. I was talking about the context of U.S. domestic politics. We as Americans in our own internal debates, I get sure. that. In, I, I get that. I for, get you, but don't forget, it's a transnational movement. It's not like, you know, the theory of the Great Replacement that yeah. is used. It comes from here. I know. I know. So but I don't I think. Mean, okay, I don't think Marine Le Pen is equivalent to Hitler. I don't think the Sweden Democrats are equivalent not, to Hitler. I didn't say that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why I think Germany distorts our conversation because it makes us think about things that actually aren't very relevant for modern day France. Marine Le Pen is a different challenge than you know, the Hitler. The was created by the former Waffen-SS. So well, I yeah, I know, they're, they're post-fascist. That's they're, These are all post-fascist parties. I would say neo-fascist, actually, even because it's not just I mean, again, we can debate about, but anyway, I'm glad the question of inequality was raised because I think it's central. And when we read the polls, like the people deciding to, indeed, like that's what um, a certain number of percent of French, German, Swedish, American think that X, Y, Z, like we should ban immigration, we should uh, ban abortion, et cetera. But if I take the example of France, the latest election, and let's pick up your control of, because my memory is bad with numbers, 28% something of the French population didn't go to vote. So my question is regarding, and, and I find the, uh, the model you raised really interesting. I have so many questions, but that's not the point. But <clears throat> where abstention stands in that? How do we get to the people who, for whatever reasons, because it can be laziness to Y'all not representing me, minorities, uh, people who are being disenfranchised are like, I'm tired of being used. If you, we're talking about Muslims in France, like we are talking. So you use us like to get the far right voters, but then we have to save the Republic. So I'm not going to vote, why voting? So in all of those models that you discuss, how and if it is possible to tackle the question of abstention and if I'm not wrong even in the US with gerrymandering and so on like abstention or even worse when you prevent someone from voting by gerrymandering or like all of those you know um, vo voting laws that has passed to limit basically minorities um, to vote how do we tackle that and how any of these models might be a solution or not so that's an open question Maybe just a closing minute statement of peace. How about that? 
Yeah, okay. Just for, I don't have, Len will have more to say about some of the practicalities. Um, but 28% abstention sounds awesome. Like as an American, if we could have 28%, uh, what do you call co- I think she meant the opposite. <laughs> what? No, no, I think she meant 28% are abstaining. That means 70. No, but I think you, she, you meant the opposite, right? That 70% are, because that's what the- that was. She built a tie in France, but compared to America, it's low. She, have, she must have meant the opposite. No, 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 no I know. No, she did. She did. She no, no, no. She, well, abstained. in local election, the no, use No, I think she's abstained. talking national elections. Ah, okay. So uh, I don't know then. It's a weird point to me. Uh, then. Okay, but anyway, okay. anyway, just, just, just yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, voter, but like, um, short of mandatory voting, um, people have the. I, I don't know how you force people to vote, except you make it a legal requirement. Yeah, sure. I, I'd be. I'd support that. I support. Yeah, I support making it easier to vote, but some people don't want to make it easier to vote. Yeah. So. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Twenty-eight percent did not vote. <laughs> to us. Wow. I'm impressed. That's that's great. Well, we Americans are here to tell you something's going right. Uh, <laughs> um. So I, I'll just say that I think we, we, we live in regimes that have been created in the 18th century and that haven't been updated in a long time. We've expanded the franchise, certainly, but we still rely on elections that are extremely costly. They uh, attract often the wrong types of, of you know, people. Uh, there are other approaches that at the very least could augment our system that we need to look into. And I think it's happening and it's a good thing. And it's not just for actually states, it's also for cities, for you know, organi- political organizations of all kinds, including corporations, including uh, you know, school boards, hospitals, etc. So I just encourage you to read more about sortition because I, I think it's one possible solution to some of the problems of democracy. Uh, and a brief comment from me concluding is just to thank uh, both of you, but to thank you, Shadi, for raising the sort of Muslim religion in Europe theme and uh, thread, which I think I read something, I think maybe Katrin did a piece some time ago about Mus- Muslim envy uh, or something about sort of change, Muslim envy. Inspired by Shadi. Inspired by Shadi, yes. Yeah. So yeah. It's, 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 it made it to print, that's great. Maybe something tomorrow will make it to print, you never know. But, but the, uh, the idea of um, a, a, pl- a, a continent where there's a little bit lesser uh, religious vitality and yet having this larger conversation, which we're trying to, um, inspire and explore here, um, um, you know, and, the, and the, the piece of Muslim immigration, obviously incredibly complex, uh, contributes something to that in terms of the religiosity of, of England and so forth. So anyway, thank you for, for raising that piece. Uh, hey, thanks to all for a contentious, engaging uh, conversation. Not bad for an actor. Hey, welcome, James McCauley. Thanks for, for uh, it was great to see you. Uh, it, it all gets better. It all gets better from here. Sorry, uh, Teresa and Tunku and Tim, that we didn't get the last questions, but we'll get to you tomorrow in particular and hopefully more, more conversations to follow.